We can't always carry as much water as we need when we're out and about because it's just too heavy. It weighs one kilograms per litre. And in the UK, we are recommended to carry a minimum of two litres per day uh, and more if we're overnighting or we've got dogs with us as well. So on a multi-day trip, that quickly becomes unscalable and being able to source water in the wild is really useful. Now, if you do need to collect water from the wild, it's important to understand that different types of water source have different types and levels of risk, particularly in the UK, because we're so heavily populated. Now, collecting water from a remote mountain stream is a very different proposition to collecting wild water from a river downstream of a major city or town. So we need to think about that. There are two main types of risk in the UK. They are biological, which includes parasites, bacteria and viruses, and then there's chemical. And the basic rule of thumb is the further water travels from its point of origin, the more likely it is to pick up contaminants from different sources. For example, if you go to a remote mountain stream and go to, or, or a spring for example, the chances are it's only gonna have local kind of uh, parasites and uh, bacteria in there. But as that water travels downhill and it goes through farmland, it can pick up sort of chemical runoff and pesticides from local agriculture. Then as it goes further downstream again, uh, you know, and it passes through towns and cities, then quite often effluent is released into rivers, you know, and then it can pick up some new kind of man-made introduced viruses, such as hepatitis A. Now in the mountains, I'd be comfortable collecting from most sources of water, including springs, streams, and lakes, providing that we're in any red flags, such as dead fish, dead plants, or a bloom of blue-green algae, which is quite toxic. Now in the lowlands, I'd be a lot more selective, and I'd be looking for either a spring because that can filter a lot of the contaminants through the rock. Or failing that, I'd look for a clear, still body of water, something like a, a pond or a lake that isn't surrounded by farmland, so you're not gonna get that chemical runoff. Now, rivers, I would use if I had to, but because they tend to travel a lot, and I don't know what's happened upstream, they could have passed through a major city, for example, I would shy away from, unless I really had to. For example, I'm now at the highest point of a couple of kilometres and there's lots of puddles that have been filled with rainwater because we've had a lot of rain over the last couple of days. So I'm pretty confident that this water is fairly fresh. It won't have any sort of chemical contaminants in there and it's likely to be just kind of bacterial and maybe viral and, and sort of parasitic as well. Now, if I look around behind me, that water is quite cloudy, but there's a puddle in front of me which is really almost crystal clear and I would be fairly confident myself in collecting water from here. But you've got to trust your spidey senses, use your common sense because there's always an element of risk. Once you've found your water source, the next thing we need to do is collect the water. And it's important we try and not stir the water as much as possible because you really want to collect as clean and clear water as we can. Because the first thing we're going to do after collecting is we're going to give this water a visual inspection and we're going to have a look at what's in there. Now what I can see looking at this is I do have some sediment at the bottom. Uh, so obviously we'll need to try and remove that. And also this water has a definite colour to it. Now this is water I collected at the lake, so this is you know, wild dirty water, and we're definitely gonna to need to treat this. And the first step we would do is we put it through a coarse filter, like a mill bank bag, or if you happen to improvise, something like a bandana. Now I've conveniently forgotten both today, so I'm gonna improvise using a bit of tissue and see how that works. And this is obviously going to take a while and the benefit of a mill bank bag is you can just hang it up and let it do its thing. Now I've got to point out that all this does is remove the sediment and the cloudiness from the water. It does not remove the parasites, bacteria or viruses and so we will still need to sterilise this water. But as you can see it's a lot clearer now and there's no sediment in there so I would be comfortable to move on to the second stage of sterilising this water. When it comes to purifying or sterilizing the water, the most reliable means by far is boiling because that will kill all living organisms. You don't need to leave it for any length of time. You just need to get it to a good hard boil, which looks like this, and that's enough. There is some debate about how long you need to leave water boiling for at altitudes over 2000 feet. But as in the UK, the highest mountain is well below that. I'm not gonna pop the lid off that particular can of worms. One of the great things about boiling is you can see it working. So you know that that water is going to be free from all biological contaminants. Now, another method is chemical treatment using something like chlorine tablets. And the British Army have been doing this for years and it's a really convenient method. All you do is you take your tablet from your pack, you put it into the top of your bottle, screw it down, and then just give it a couple of minutes for that tablet to dissolve into the water. 
Now, once it's dissolved, it's important you then give it a good shake in order to disperse the solution around, and then you need to leave it for at least 30 minutes in order for this solution to do its thing and kill any bacteria, viruses, and waterborne parasites. Now, a good tip is when you're doing that and you're giving it a shake, is if you loosen the water, water uh, top, give it a shake then, and that way, any loose sort of solution will kind of splash out into the threads, and then it'll treat the threads of your bottle as well, where any dirty water might be trapped. That makes it a little bit safer. A word of caution if you are using chlorine tablets is that they are less effective if you use them when the water is turbid or cloudy. And studies have shown that you know bacteria and virus can still survive the standard dose and treatment after 30 minutes um, you know, in that case. So it's always better to put it through a pre-filter first, like a millbank bag, in order to clear any sediment and give the tablets a best chance of working. Now, there's also a lot of debate about what chlorine tablets will actually kill. And while they've been rated at being very effective against bacteria and viruses, there's a lot of debate about how effective they are against some waterborne organisms. Now, two are very common in the UK. One is Giardia, and the second one is called Cryptosporidium. And the chlorine tablets have been found to be ineffective against those in many situ situations. Now, while the packaging claims that it can kill Giardia and Cryptosporidium, they're talking about a particular form of these uh, pathogens because they go through different life stages. They start off as something called a trophozyte, um, and then it eventually gets like a, a casing around it and it becomes what's known as a cyst. And what the studies have shown is that the chlorine is effective against the trophozytes, but not necessarily against the cysts. And enough of them have survived the treatment in order to still be viable and make you sick. Now, this is because I think the studies where they, they show the kind of test results, it's all to do with the contact time, how long you leave it in, and the water temperature. And the higher the water temperature, the more effective the chlorine is. Now, at typical UK water temperatures, it's a lot lower. And you know, there's lots of evidence there to suggest that there's enough cysts that will survive in order to still make you sick. So there is that residual risk of using chlorine that you need to be aware of. And the other thing to be aware of when using chlorine tablets is that it does leave the water with a bit of a smell. And when you taste it, it does taste a little bit like swimming pool. Now, it's not too bad. Um, I can tolerate it, but some people are really averse to it. So it's just something else to be aware of. Another method you can use is UV light. And you can get a product called SteriPen, which is simply dip into your bottle, switch it on, and it'll kill all bacteria and viruses within about 60 seconds. Now, the advantage of that is, one, it's really quick, and two, it doesn't leave any aftertaste at all. Now, the disadvantages are that while it's very effective against bacteria and viruses, there's a lot of debate about how effective it is against some of the larger waterborne organisms, such as tapeworms, and again, Giardia and Cryptosporidium when it's in cyst form. The final method of purifying our water is filtration. And filtration is the only method capable of removing all biological contaminants, including viruses and chemicals. And yes, I know some of you are gonna bang into your keyboards now that filters can't remove viruses, but let me just qualify what I said. The first qualification is that uh, your removal does not mean complete eradication, it simply means a significant reduction. And that is the same for bacteria as well. The second qualification is, think about how your water utility company gets water to your tap. Now, what do they do? They actually filter it, and they put it through two different types of filter. The first one is called a quicksand filter, uh, where it just you know, goes through a very coarse sand to remove most of the, the main kind of particles. And then it goes through something called a slow sand filter, which is effectively still just a big bank full of sand that the water slowly goes through. And that actually removes between two log points and six log points of all viruses. And that equates to 99% and 99.9999% of viruses. This is the water to go filter bottle. Now, in theory, I should be able to drink from any freshwater source of this, including rivers, lakes, ponds, and puddles. The manufacturer claims to remove 99.9999% of bacteria and between 99.95 and 99.98% of virus. They also claim it removes all water organisms and pesticides, believe it or not, other chemicals, things like chlorine and heavy metals too. So it's a really good solution. There's just a couple of problems. The first one is this, even at 99.98%, that's still a lot of virus that's getting through. And while it does 
you know, significantly reduce that viral load and it gives my immune system a much better chance of fending something off, there are still viable viruses entering my system that could make me sick. The second problem, and probably the biggest one for me is, how do I know this is working? I can't see it working. There's no little light on there. So what it means for me is, the only way to find out if this is working is whether I get sick in a couple of days. And uh, it takes a bit of trust. Hopefully, what I've shown is that no one method is perfect. And if I was to source water in the wild, I would definitely adopt a belt and braces approach by combining two or more methods. For example, I would filter water into my stove and then boil it, or I would filter water using my squeeze system into my filter bottle, add a chlorine tablet, and then drink from the filter bottle, knowing that the chlorine will have killed anything the filters can't. And then the second filter is actually removing some of that chlorine as a drink to improve the taste. So that's giving you some information. But before you go full Bear grills, there are often safer and more convenient ways of sourcing water when you're out in the UK. The truth is, we're not that uh, wild a country, and if you're hiking throughout the UK, the chances are you're gonna pass through a village shop or a local pub, and they are obvious and your first choice of sourcing water when you're out and about. It's also worth keeping an eye out for churches, because quite often they have a water fountain inside or outside for the, for, the, for the grounds. And quite often as well, if you're passing through a town or a small village, they'll have an allotment, and allotments will quite often have a tap outside you can use too.